So now what we're going to talk about is one of my favorite topics from this course, uh, membrane potentials and everything that goes with it. That includes electrochemical gradients and the movement of ions. But before we talk about any of that material, I would like to explain to you how batteries work, especially rechargeable batteries, and the relevance of how batteries work and the membrane potential are going to become clear by the end of this review video. So bear with me for uh, just a little bit, um, but I promise you that all of this is directly relevant to the membrane potential. So here's how a battery works. If I was going to draw like a regular double A battery, if we were to slice that battery down the middle, uh, we would see this kind of setup. And as you know, all batteries, typical AA batteries, have that little bump at the top. So that's what I'm drawing right here. And there is a little divot at the bottom. Now, what we don't see inside the battery, well, sometimes we do. If you have a battery that's been uh, in a device for too long or it's just been sitting on a shelf for too long, you know how you get that like white, uh, pretty like skeevy, yucky, liquidy kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's like a white, crusty, um, some liquid that oozes out of the battery. Those it's electrolyte solution. Those are solutions that are very, very rich in ions. And some of those solutions occupy an inner chamber of the battery, and that's where a lot of electrons are. And some of that liquid occupies this outer chamber of the battery, and that's where a lot of positive ions are. And as you know, opposites attract. So those positive ions and those negative ions want to interact with each other, but they can't because the negatives are all inside that inner chamber and the positives are all outside the outer chamber. And so that's potential energy right there. The positives and the negatives want to move with each other. They want to be in motion. They want to get near each other. That's potential energy, but they can't because they're physically blocked from interacting. And that's why the energy is potential rather than kinetic. So essentially, we have wanted energy of motion rather than manifested energy of motion. These uh, ions want to flow, but they're barred from it. And just as if you hold up a weight, you have potential energy because that weight wants to drop, but it's not allowed to. These ions want to move and they can't. That's potential energy. And potential energy is measured in uh, voltage. Now, when you put this battery into a device... And remember, the device always kind of tells you, make sure the positive is on this side and the negative is on that side. When you put it into a device, essentially an electrode or a wire makes a contact with the top. And then it goes to something in the device. And maybe it's a light bulb. And then the circuit closes and it makes contacts with the bottom. And if you know a little bit about electricity, you realize that we did just make a closed circuit here. And because the circuit is closed, now electrons can flow. They can flow where they want it to flow all along. These electrons from the inner chamber will flow along the wire. They'll release energy here at the device, making the device light up or make noise or whatever it is that's happening. They'll continue in the wire and they'll get to where they've wanted to be all along. They'll get to the inner chamber, the electrons will. Pretty cool. So now that potential energy is being released as kinetic energy or energy of motion. This movement of ions, this movement of electrons, this electricity is occurring because the, the current is closed. Now that's a typical battery. That battery works for a while. It powers the remote. It powers the toy. It powers the light until ultimately all of these ions, all of these electrons reach an equilibrium which means they're balanced both on the inside and the outside of the battery chambers. And if they're at an equilibrium and they're balanced, they don't really want to flow anymore. They're even across the battery, so there's no more potential energy. There's no more voltage. And since the ions are where they want to be, the electrons are where they want to be, they don't really move down the wire in a single direction anymore. They don't have a flow. They can't create a current, and so they can't power the toy. The toy no longer works because the battery has run dry and you have to put in a new battery. Rechargeable batteries, however, you stick them in the, the wall, they have an ability or a mechanism in there to take the electrons that have flowed into the in outer chamber and pump them back into the inner chamber. Now that pumping, that takes power, that takes additional energy. But once all of the electrons have been removed from the outer chamber and all that remains out there are positives, what have we restored? We've restored that potential. We've restored that potential energy. 
we once again have a situation where electrons want to flow. We once again have a voltage. We once again have the potential for electrical flow. So that's the general idea of a battery. You keep all the negatives on one side, all the positives on the other. They want to be with each other so bad, but they can't because there's a, there's a barrier in the middle. But if you close the circuit, you create a wire, you're giving those electrons something to flow in, they will move. And then that potential energy in voltage is released as a kinetic energy in current, in amps. But they'll only flow as long as they have a potential to flow. They'll only flow as long as they want to be somewhere. Once those electrons and those ions are evenly distributed across all chambers of the battery, they don't want to flow anymore. They're not going to create a current. That battery is dead. If it's rechargeable, you can pump energy into the battery to literally pump those electrons back into their inner chamber where they were when you started, recreating the potential, recreating the voltage, making the battery work once again. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about cell membranes. So here's the cell membrane. And it is a barrier to anything that is charged, including ions. And inside the cell, there are quite a few anions, negatively charged ions, inside the cell. So this is inside, and this is outside. And also inside the cell, there tends to be a lot of potassium, a lot of potassium. And there's not so much potassium outside the cell. I think I mentioned it in the lecture itself, but I use the mnemonic kin, the word kin to remember this, as in family, you know, they are kin to me. And kin stands for potassium in, the potassium is inside the cell. Now outside the cell, there is a lot of sodium. The concentration of sodium is very high. Uh, and inside the cell, there isn't so much sodium. And this essentially is our starting point. So let's take note of a few things here. From a chemical gradient point of view, from a concentration gradient point of view, sodium wants to move in what direction? Well, like all things, it wants to move from high concentration to low. And the concentration of sodium is high outside the cell and it's low inside. So from a concentration gradient or chemical perspective, sodium wants to flow into the cell. Now let's think electrically. From a charge perspective, where does sodium want to flow? Well, from a charge perspective, remember sodium is positively charged, inside the cell is negatively charged, opposites attract. So from a charge perspective, sodium also wants to flow inside. So from this electrochemical perspective, from the perspective of both charge and gradient, sodium wants to flow inside the cell. What that means is that sodium really wants to flow inside the cell because it wants to get out of its crowded environment and it wants to get near those negatives. And so there's a strong driving force for sodium to enter the cell. Let's consider potassium. From a concentration perspective, from a chemical point of view, potassium wants to move out of the cell. It's very crowded for potassium inside the cell. It's much roomier outside the cell. Potassium wants to follow its concentration gradient and leave the cell. From an electrical perspective, potassium wants to move into the cell because inside the cell is negative and potassium is positive and opposites attract. So from potassium's point of view, it has forces driving it out, chemical, it has forces driving it in, electrical, and those forces counteract each other. And essentially, there's no net force on potassium. Potassium is free to be where it wants to be. It doesn't have a net force driving it in any direction. To say that in a different way, there is no potential energy stored in potassium because potassium doesn't want to move. There is potential energy stored in sodium because sodium desperately wants to move inside the cell. There are potassium channels in the cell, but they tend to be ungated. In other words, it's just an open door. Potassium is free to leave when it wants to, and it doesn't have to leave if it doesn't want to. There are also doors for sodium inside the cell, but those doors or channels are gated channels. They're gated to keep sodium out unless the time has come to bring it in. We have just established a membrane potential. Just like there's potential energy in a battery, there is potential energy here in this membrane setup. Where is that potential energy? It's all in sodium. Sodium wants to flow. It desperately wants to get into the cell, but it can't 
because of those closed gated channels. Sodium wants to enter the cell because of its concentration gradient. Sodium wants to enter the cell because of its, its electrical gradient, but it can't because those channels are closed. That's potential energy. Just like our electrons wanted to flow from the inside of the battery to the outside, but they couldn't because they were compartmentalized, sodium wants to flow from outside the cell to inside the cell, but it can't because of the membrane and those closed channels. This is a membrane potential, and just like all potentials, in the, in the electrical sense, it can even be measured in volts, millivolts in this case. So now let's change that potential energy into kinetic energy. In order to get energy of motion, we really only need to do one thing. And if you've been following along, you probably have spotted that the only thing we need to do is open that gated channel. If we open this sodium channel, and it can be opened because of electrical stimuli in a neuron or physical stimuli in a stressor sensing cell. Lots of things can open a sodium channel depending on the type of cell you are. Once that sodium channel is opened, sodium is going to get to do what it's wanted to do all along. It's going to go rushing inside the cell, following its chemical gradient, following its electrical gradient, and sodium is going to rapidly enter the cell. That's energy of motion. That's kinetic energy. That energy of motion can be harnessed by the cell with a bunch of different membrane-bound proteins. That kin kinetic energy, that energy of sodium motion can be used to power other cellular processes. It can be captured as ATP. That can do lots of things. But what's important here for our purposes is that it is now kinetic energy. Let's reflect on a moment on what was keeping potassium inside the cell. Remember, from a chemical gradient point of view, potassium desperately wanted to leave. But from an electrical point of view, an ionic point of view, potassium wanted to stay inside. Sodium is positively charged. Sodium just came rushing into the cell. The inside of the cell just became a lot more positive, or to say that a different way, it just became a lot more, a lot less negative. Potassium was happy staying inside the cell because of all that negative charge, and that negative charge is now diluted, in a sense, by all the sodium that came rushing in. So now, potassium begins to leave. It begins to leave the cell because the interior of the cell is less hospitable to it. Since the ionic forces are not as great as they were before, the chemical forces take over, and potassium begins to leave the cell. All of this continues to happen until an equilibrium is reached, until the levels of sodium in and out of the cell are balanced and the levels of potassium inside and out of the cell are balanced. When that equilibrium is reached, there is no longer a membrane potential. The voltage across the membrane is zero. The battery has gone dry. But this battery is rechargeable. Just like we can plug a rechargeable battery into the wall and use electrical power to pump electrons back into the inner chamber, we have a pump here as well that can restore the membrane potential back to what it was before. That pump is called, not surprisingly, the sodium-potassium pump. And it uses energy from ATP to grab sodiums from inside the cell and pump them back out and to grab potassiums from outside the cell and pump them back in. When the sodium potassium pump has done its job, much of the potassium that has leaked out of the cell is pumped back in and much of the sodium that has entered into the cell is pumped back out the action of the sodium-potassium pump recharges this cellular battery and restores the membrane potential. As the sodium-potassium pump was running, these gated sodium channels closed, and if we have sodium outside the cell, where it is both highly concentrated and positive, and we have potassium inside the cell, where it is more concentrated but negative, we have potential energy restored. We have a scenario where sodium once again desperately wants to rush inside that cell, but it can't because the channel is closed. 
and we have potassium happily staying inside the cell, even though its channel is open, because that's where it is electrically and chemically balanced. By restoring the membrane potential, we restore this energy reserve, and this battery of the cell has been recharged. So to recap briefly, we start off with a scenario where there is very little sodium inside the cell and very little potassium outside the cell. The interior of the cell is negative. Potassium is content to stay inside the cell. Though its concentration gradient is attempting to force it out, its ionic gradient is keeping it in. Those forces are balanced. The net force on potassium is zero. It stays inside the cell. Sodium, on the other hand, has two forces driving it into the cell, its concentration gradient and the ionic attraction for those negative charges. But sodium is blocked from flowing because it has gated channels which are closed. Though energy wants to be released by sodium, it can't be. Though sodium wants to flow, it cannot. And this stored energy is, a mem is an energy potential that we refer to as the membrane potential measured in millivolts. Once those channels open, Sodium begins to do what it wanted to do. It flows into the cell. As sodium enters the cell, the interior of the cell becomes more positive because sodium is positive. Potassium being positive is repelled by this positive interior of the cell and potassium begins to leave. This energy of motion is now kinetic energy, sodium entering the cell and potassium leaving. And this kinetic energy can be captured and used by the cell for a variety of its energy requiring processes. Once sodium and potassium reach an equilibrium, they no longer flow. There's no force on them. There's no more kinetic energy to harness. The cellular battery is empty. That's when the sodium potassium pump begins to burn ATP and it uses that ATP, uh, that energy of ATP hydrolysis to pump potassium back into the cell where it was to begin and sodium out of the cell where it started. In the meantime, the sodium gated channels, the, the sodium channels that are gated close. And when we restore a concentration of sodium outside the cell and a concentration of potassium inside the cell, we've restored the membrane potential. We again have stored potential energy across the membrane and this battery of the cell has been recharged.